I'm going to make haste, amen, for there is a word from the Lord. Amen. Tell your neighbor, there's a word. There's a word for you. Represent the external forces of life 
that often blow against us. Those things that prevent us from going where God has intended for us to go. Uh, it was these very same winds that caused the waters to crash up against the ship. It was this very same wind that caused the water to fill the boat. Yeah. Uh, but it is the ship that is uh, said to be the heart of the believer, yeah. where Jesus all resides. Yeah. Yeah. It is the water that represents the soul and the emotions of the believer. Because many times when the external factors of life bear their weight and their wind against the believer, it is our very soul and the emotions that are affected by these external factors that begin to overwhelm us, that begin to overcome us, that sometimes we drown in our own emotions based off of the things that people outside of us have done. It caused us to lift up the question for every crisis that you come into, every problem that arises in your life, you need to first figure out how much of this is due to what others are doing or how I have responded to what others have done to me. Some of the arguments suggest that life is 90% not of what happens to us, 10% of what happens to us, 90% of how we respond to it. For it was the wind that Jesus rebuked, but it was the war that Jesus said, peace, be still. And I wonder how many believers under the sound of my voice can benefit from the sound doctrine of being told, peace, be still. I don't know, I know what you're going through is bad. I know they may not like you. I know they may be against you. I know it may seem like you're against all odds, but the Bible says, peace, be still, and know that We must be reminded that God is with us. For scripture says he will not leave us nor save us. Uh, that's what the message uh, the last time I was before you that, that really we have to control our own emotions. And, and if ever they get to a place where they begin to overwhelm us, we can always call. Somebody should have got happy right there. We can always call on the name. On the name of Jesus. You may be in your storm now and been there too long because you failed, amen, uh, to take it to Jesus. But it, but it is this week that we lift up the same passage, but uh, we focus our attention on the idea and the fact that when Jesus set out to the other side, he told the disciples that there was somewhere that they must go. It lifts up an important fact that in life not only will there be seasons, but in all of our life there's also purpose, destiny, and appointments. Yes, that literally God says he orders the steps of the righteous. And even though the disciples did not know where they were going, when they would get there, or what was waiting on them, God already knew. Yeah. And we can take confidence in the fact that God has already mapped out your life. Yes. That God has already planned and ordered your steps. Yes. And God has not only appointments that are waiting on you, which I'm going to preach about next week. All right. But also that God is ultimately with you along the way and that whatever you encounter, on your way to becoming what God has called you to be, you can rest assured that God is using it to prepare you for what's next in your life. If you believe in Christ, you can't believe in coincidence. Because the believers of a living God know, amen, that there's nothing outside the control of God who knows all things, sees all things, is everywhere. He tells a story of his father's dying words. Uh, 
he uh, pastor coming from a fine family of pastors, for he and his brother's pastor. His father pastored most of his adult life, even at one point pastoring seven churches at one time. His father was always providing him with insight and encouragement for the journey. Uh, his father was not only concerned with his exhortation and, and building up and edification, but he also was concerned that he edify, build up, and encourage the people. As a matter of fact, it doesn't matter what they did and where they were, before he left, his father always told him, make sure you tell the people this. Amen. He was giving him tidbits to go and share with the congregations and the parishioners that he pastored. He said, make sure you tell the people to be still and know that there is a God. Make sure you tell the people that they can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives them strength. Make sure you tell the people, amen, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Make sure you tell the people, amen, that there is a God who sits high and looks low. Make sure you tell the people, amen, that the Lord is their shepherd. They need not want. Uh, he never failed that whenever he spent time with his father, his father gave him something to go back and tell the people. Well, here it was. His father was on his deathbed, and uh, he had become uh, uh, extremely ill and sick. And, uh, he knew that his father was transitioning to a better place. And as much as he rejoiced in the idea that his father was heaven bound, there was something in him that wanted to hold on to the conversation and the insight that his father had always given him. And as his father's eyes glassed over, and he said it seemed as though his father was already looking into heaven, he wanted to hear his father's voice just one more time. And he knew that if he asked him this one question, yeah, yeah. he knew his father was going to have something to say. Yeah. And so his father's dying and parting words to him were well, response to the question, Dad, uh -huh. yeah. what do you want me to tell Peter? <laughs> His father said in his last words to his son, tell the people to stay with Jesus and to stay with the church. I want to preach this morning from the subject, stay with the church. Come on, help me preach and tell your name to stay with the church. Tell your other name to stay with the church. In the state newspaper, uh, there was an article written by Sarah Ellis this year. Uh, it was an alarming article. And I believe the article was written with the intention to be an alarm. Uh, it was entitled, Losing Faith. Why South Carolina is Abandoning Its Churches. Uh, it was an article that I sent to all of our deacons uh, via text uh, through a link because I wanted them to read it. Uh, because it dealt with an issue of concern that really churches have to become acutely aware of. In this article, it talked about the fact that there were many churches that were closing across our state. That literally in the past few years, a uh, hundred or so churches have closed their doors. The Pew Research Center <coughs> describes that the United States is now in the midst middle of a significant religious change. Yeah. That as people find it less important to go to church. Yeah. As people visit churches but won't become members of churches. As individuals sow seeds that don't represent the sacredness of church but the opposite. Uh, the church has to become aware of this changing tide that is rising. Uh, as people are now declaring themselves more spiritual than religious. You heard it. Amen. Bless the Lord. You might be one of them. Amen. Preach they can. Uh, the church finds itself facing With the rise of the religious unaffiliated, where they say they believe in God, 
but they can't tell you what about God they believe in. With the increasing growth of individualism, where people feel like, well, if it ain't nothing in it for me, then why do I need to be in it? Church affiliation has become, for many, a decreasingly less appealing option. While churches close and memberships plummet, the Facebook faithful grows exponentially. People are more committed to posting on Facebook, appreciate me. And seeing what everybody's doing on Facebook rather than congregating together with believers to do the work of the law. When Instagram fellowship has outnumbered church fellowships, let me, let me make that one plan. When you got more people following the Instagram models, then you got people showing up on church on Sundays. To follow Jesus who is the Christ. I believe it's time that the church says, Houston, we got a problem. Now I'm dating myself a little bit. I know we're no longer in the exponential increase and space exploration stage as NASA has for the most part closed its doors. But but when I was growing up, you know, it was something for a space shuttle to take off from Florida. Amen. How many people remember Challenger and the explosion? Amen. Uh, 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 it, 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 it was something to see those who were human like us enter into the great beyond. And, 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 and we watched on the air. Houston was a central station of communication and control for all of the space missions. If they said, Houston, we have trouble, we knew that it was a life or death situation. And that in any moment, things could get increasingly worse. Yeah. Tell you, David, Houston, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Some have argued that the church is just outdated and old. That the church uh, is no longer hip or relevant. Some have argued the church just doesn't know how to grow. Some have said the church just doesn't even know how to treat people. Some have argued, amen. 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 Some have argued that the church is just too messy. <laughs> and filled with too many hypocrites. <laughs> now toting, Bible thumpers, holier than thou, two righteous people that ain't living right themselves. I'm telling you what they say. <laughs> but tell you they will stay with the church. <laughs> many, many, many have said, amen, bless the Lord, that church, a good analogy for the church is that it's a lot like Noah's Ark. For God said that he was going to send a rain. Before the end it had not rained. Only two rolls from the ground. But God said he would not only send a rain, but he wasn't going to let it stop. And the earth was flooded, but before it flooded, God told Noah to gather two of every kind of creature and that he would take them apart of the ark. And they would the remnant, the righteous that God would save from the flood. Now, now can I paint a picture for you? Now, he's gathered every kind of beast. Amen. Two of each one. And for 40 days and for 40 nights, all of these animals are on the ship and they eat. And now they And the 
to show a whole lot safer to be in the ark than to be outside of the ark. For I believe 
represent other things that lead us into believing that can get us what God wants us to be. Stay with me now. For there are a lot of other little ships in the world that chart the same course but don't have the same captain. You see, I believe uh, the little ships are the NAACP, a good organization that does a lot of good, but, but Jesus ain't on the ship. Tell me that Jesus ain't on the ship. Black, Black Lives Matter, promoting the emphasis that every life, particularly ones of black youth who are disproportionately killed, should be cared for and they should matter. It, it, it's a ship, chart the same course, but tell you later, Jesus ain't on board. For all my green level organizations, amen, female and male, amen, I gotta say KSI first, amen, but even all the ones that follow that after, whether you are an AKA or a Delta or a Zeta, amen, or a Q or a Sigma, if, 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 charting the same course, but tell you later, Jesus, Jesus ain't on board.
It's, it's, ah, uh, no, that's not. <laughs> you know, um, we have to be careful that as we face this crisis and this challenge, people losing the understanding of how sacred Sunday is and the importance of church. This grandparent Sunday. Yeah. And I want you to remember the words of your grandparents. Yeah. I want you to remember the faithfulness of your grandparents. They didn't have half the resources that we had. But they served the God. They served the God that allowed you to be where you are today. And Church will be the church. Everything else will fall into place. 